The Mahabharata of Krishna Gvapriyana Vyosa Book 1 Adiparva Section 159 Vakaveda Parva Janamaya asked, O first of Brahmanas, what did the Pandavas, those mighty car warriors, the sons have Kante, get after arriving at Ekakakra? Vayampayana said, Those mighty car warriors, the sons have Kante, on arriving at Ekakakra, lived for a short time in the abode of a Brahmana. Leading an Elimasena life, they behold, in course of their wanderings, various delightful forests and earthly regions, and many rivers and lakes, and they became great favorites of the inhabitants of the town in consequence of their own accomplishments. At nightfall they placed before Kunti all they gathered in their Mantichan tours, and Kunti used to divide the whole amongst them, each taking what was allotted to him. And those heroic chastisers of foes, with their mother, together took one mighty of the whole, while the mighty Bhama alone took the other mighty. In this way, O bull of Bharata's race, the illustrious Pandavas lived there for some time. One day, while those bulls of the Bharata race were out on their tour of mendicancy, it so happened that Bhama was, at home, with, his mother, Prita. That day, O Bharata, Kandi heard a loud and heart-rending wail of sorrow coming from within the apartments of the Brahmana. Hearing the inmates of the Brahmana's house wailing and indulging in piteous lamentations, Kanti, O King, from compassion and the goodness of her heart, could not bear it with indifference. Afflicted with sorrow, the amiable Prita, addressing Bhima, said these words full of compassion. Our woes assuaged, we are, O son, living happily in the house of this Brahmana, respected by him and unknown to Dharitarashtras son. O son, I always think of the good I should do to this Brahmana, like what they do that live happily in others' abodes. O child, he is a true man upon whom favors are never lost. He path back to others more than what he receiveth at their hands. There's no doubt, some affliction hath overtaken this Brahmana. If we could be of any help to him, we should then be requiting his services. Hearing these words of his mother, Bhima said, Ascertain, O mother, the nature of the Brahmana's distress and whence also it hath arisen. Learning all about it, relieve it I will however difficult may the task prove. Vayampayana continued while mother and son were thus talking with each other, they heard again, O king, another wail of sorrow proceeding from the Brahmana and his wife. Then Kani quickly entered the inner apartments of that illustrious Brahmana, like unto a cow running towards our tethered calf. She beheld the Brahmana with his wife, son and daughter, sitting with a woeful face, and she heard the Brahmana say, Oh, fee on this earthly life which is hollow as the reed and so fruitless after all which is based on sorrow and hath no freedom, and which hath misery for its lot. Life is sorrow and disease. Life is truly a record of misery. The soul is one, but it hath to pursue virtue, wealth and pleasure. And because these are pursued at one and the same time, there frequently occurs a disagreement that is the source of much misery. Some say that salvation is the highest object of our desire. But I believe it can never be attained. The acquisition of wealth is hell. The pursuit of wealth is attended with misery. There is more misery after one has acquired it, for one loves one's possessions, and if any mishap befalls them, the possessor becomes afflicted with woe. I do not see by what means I can escape from this danger, nor how I can fly hence, with my wife to some region free from danger. Remember, O oh wife, that I endeavored to migrate to some other place where we would be happy, but thou didst not then listen to me. Though frequently solicited by me, thou, O oh simple woman, said to me, I have been born here, and here have I grown old. This is my ancestral homestead. Thy venerable father, O oh wife, and thy mother also, have, a long time ago, ascended to heaven. Thy relations also had all been dead. O oh, why then didst thou yet like to live here? 
that by affection for thy relatives thou didst not then hear what I said. But the time is now come when thou art to witness the death of a relative. Oh, how sad is that spectacle for me. Or perhaps the time is come for my own death, for I shall never be able to abandon cruelly one of my own as long as I myself am alive. Thou art my helpmate in all good deeds, self-denying and always affectionate unto me as a mother. The gods have given thee to me as a true friend and thou art ever my prime stay. Thou hast, by my parents, been made the participator in my domestic concerns. Thou art of pure lineage and good disposition, the mother of children, devoted to me, and so innocent. Having chosen and wedded thee with due rights, I cannot abandon thee, my wife, so constant in thy vows, to save my life. How shall I myself be able to sacrifice my son a child of tender years and yet without the hair's appendages of manhood? How shall I sacrifice my daughter whom I have begotten myself, who hath been placed, as a pledge, in my hands by the Creator himself for bestowal on a husband and through whom I hope to enjoy, along with my ancestors, the regions attainable by those only that have daughters' sons? Some people think that the father's affection for a son is greater, others, that his affection for a daughter is greater, mine, however, is equal. How can I be prepared to give up the innocent daughter upon whom rest the regions have bliss obtainable by me in afterlife and my own lineage and perpetual happiness? If, again, I sacrifice myself and go to the other world, I should scarcely know any peace, for, indeed, it is evident that, left by me these would not be able to support life. The sacrifice of any of these would be cruel and censurable. On the other hand, if I sacrifice myself, these, without me, will certainly perish. The distress into which I have fallen is great, nor do I know the means of escape. Alas, what course shall I take today with my near ones? It is well that I should die with all these, for I can live no longer. Section 160 Vayampani Anna said, on hearing these words of the Brahmana, his wife said, Thou shalt not, O Brahmana, grieve like an ordinary man. Nor is this the time for mourning. Thou hast learning. Thou knowest that all men are sure to die? None should grieve for that which is inevitable. Wife, son, and daughter, all these are sought for one's own self. As thou art possessed of a good understanding, kill thou thy sorrows. I will myself go there. This indeed, is the highest and the eternal duty of a woman, namely, that by sacrificing her life she should seek the good of her husband. Such an act done by me will make thee happy, and bring me fame in this world and eternal bliss hereafter. This, indeed, is the highest virtue that I tell thee, and thou mayst, by this, acquire both virtue and happiness. The object for which one does serve the wife hath already been achieved by thee through me. I have borne thee a daughter and a son, and thus been freed from the dead I had owed thee. Thou art well able to support and cherish the children, but I however, can never support and cherish them like thee. Thou art my life, wealth, and lord, bereft of thee, how shall these children of tender years, how also shall I myself, exist? Widowed and masterless, with two children depending on me, how shall I, without thee, keep alive the pair, myself leading an honest life? If the daughter of thine is solicited, in marriage, by persons dishonorable and vain and unworthy of contracting an alliance with thee, how shall I be able to protect the girl? Indeed, as birds seek with avidity for meat that hath been thrown away on the ground, so do men solicit a woman that hath lost her husband. O best of Brahmanas, solicited by wicked men, I may waver and may not be able to continue in the path that is desired by all honest men. How shall I be able to place this sole daughter of thy house, this innocent girl, in the way along which her ancestors have always walked? How shall I then be able to impart unto this child every desirable accomplishment to make him virtuous as thyself, in that season of one when I shall become masterless? 
overpowering myself who shall be masterless, and worthy persons will demand the hand of this daughter of thine, like citrus desiring to hear the Vedas. And if I bestow not upon them this girl possessing thy blood and qualities, they may even take her away by force, like crows carrying away the sacrificial butter. And beholding thy son become so unlike to thee, and thy daughter placed under the control of some unworthy persons, I shall be despised in the world by even persons that are dishonorable, and I will certainly die. These children also, bereft of me and thee, their father, will, I doubt not, perish like fish when the water drinketh up. There is no doubt that bereft of thee the three will perish, therefore it better that thee to sacrifice me. O Brahmana, persons conversing with morals have said that for women that have borne children, to predecease their lords is an act of the highest merit. Ready am I to abandon this son and this daughter, these my relations, and life itself, for thee. For a woman to be ever employed in doing agreeable offices to her lord is a higher duty than sacrifices, asceticism, vows, and charities of every description. The act, therefore, which I intend to perform is consonant with the highest virtue and is for thy good and that of thy race. The wise have declared that children and relatives and wife and all things held dear are cherished for the purpose of liberating oneself from danger and distress. One must guard one's wealth for freeing oneself from danger, and it is by his wealth that he should cherish and protect his wife. But he must protect his own self both by means of his wife and his wealth. The learned have enunciated the truth that one's wife, son, wealth, and house, are acquired with the intention of providing against accidents, foreseen or unforeseen. The wise have also said that all one's relations weighed against one's own self would not be equal unto one's self. Therefore, revered sir, protect thy own self by abandoning me. Oh, give me leave to sacrifice myself, and cherish thou my children. Those that are conversing with the morals have, in their treatises, said, that women should never be slaughtered and that righteousness are not ignorant of the rules of morality. Therefore, while it is certain that the rich also will kill a man, it is doubtful whether he will kill a woman. It better that thee, therefore, being conversing with the rules of morality, to place me before the Rikshasa. I have enjoyed much happiness, have obtained much that is agreeable to me, and have also acquired great religious merit. I have also obtained from thee children that are so dear to me. Therefore, it grieveth not me to die. I have borne thee children, and have also grown old. I am ever desirous of doing good to thee. Remembering all these, I have come to this resolution. O revered sir, abandoning me thou mayst obtain another wife. By her thou mayst again acquire religious merit. There is no sin in this. For a man polygamy is an act of merit, but for a woman it is very sinful to bedded herself to a second husband after the first. Considering all this, and remembering too that sacrifice of thy own self is censurable, O, oh, liberate today without loss of time thy own self, thy race, and these thy children, by abandoning me. Vehampani Anna continued, thus stressed by her, O D H A R A T A, the Brahmana embraced her, and they both began to weep in silence, afflicted with grief. Section 161 Vahampani Anna said, on hearing these words of her afflicted parents, the daughter was filled with grief, and she addressed them, saying, Why are you so afflicted and why do you so weep, as if you have none to look after you? Oh, listen to me and do what may be proper. There is little doubt that you're bound in duty to abandon me at a certain time. Sure to abandon me once, oh, abandon me now and save everything at the expense of me alone. Men desire to have children, thinking that children would save them, in this world as well as in the region hereafter. Oh, cross the stream of your difficulties by means of my poor self, as if I were a raft. A child rescueth his parents in this and the other regions, therefore is the child called by the learned putra, rescuer. 
the ancestors desire daughter sons from me, as a special means of salvation. But, without waiting for my children, I myself will rescue them by protecting the life of my father. This my brother is of tender years, so there is little doubt that he will perish if thou dost now. If thou, my father, didst and my brother fall over thee, the funeral cake of the Pythoras will be suspended and they will be greatly injured. Left behind by my father and brother, and by my mother also, for she will not survive her husband and son, I shall be plunged deeper and deeper in woe and ultimately perish in great distress. There can be little doubt that if thou escape from this danger as also my mother and infant brother, then the iris and the ancestral cake will be perpetuated. The son is one's own self, the wife is one's friend, the daughter, however, is a source of trouble. Do thou save thyself, therefore, by removing that source of trouble, and do thou thereby set me in the path of virtue. As I am a girl, O father, destitute of thee, I shall be helpless and plunged in woe, and shall have to go everywhere. It is therefore that I am resolved to rescue my father's race and share the merit of that act by accomplishing this difficult task. If thou, O best of Brahmanas, goes thither, unto the Rikshasa, leaving me here, then I shall be very much pained. Therefore, O father, be kind to me. O thou best of men, for our Saka, for that of virtue and also thy race, save thyself, abandoning me, whom at one time thou shall be constrained to part from. There need be no delay, O father, in doing that which is inevitable. What can be more painful than that, when thou hast ascended to heaven, we shall have to go about begging our food, like dogs, from strangers. But if thou art rescued with thy relations from these difficulties, I shall then live happily in the region of the Celestials. It hath been heard by us that if after bestowing thy daughter in this way, thou offerest oblations to the gods in the Celestials, they will certainly be propitious. Vayampayana continued, the Brahmana and his wife, hearing these various lamentations of their daughter, became sadder than before and the three began to weep together. Their son, then, of tender years, beholding them and their daughter thus weeping together, lists these words in a sweet tone, his eyes having dilated with delight, Weep not, O father, nor thou, O mother, nor thou, O sister. And smilingly did the child approach each of them, and at last taking up a blade of grass said in glee, With this will I slay the rikshas who eateth human beings. Although all of them had been plunged in woe, yet hearing what the child listened so sweetly, joy appeared on their faces. Then Kunti thinking that to be the proper opportunity, approached the group and said these words. Indeed, her words revived them as nectar reviveth a person that is dead. Section 162 Kunti said, I desire to learn from you the cause of this grief for I will remove it, if possible. The Brahma replied, O thou of ascetic wealth, thy speech is, indeed worthy of thee. But this grief is incapable of being removed by any human being. Not far from this town, there liveth a rich house of the name of Akka, which cannibal is the lord of this country and town. Thriving on human flesh, that wretched rich house endued with great strength ruled this country. He being the chief of the Ajaras, this town and the country in which it is situated are protected by his might. We have no fear from the machinations of any enemy, or indeed from any living soul. The fee, however, fixed for the cannibal is his food, which consists of a cartload of rice, two buffaloes, and a human being who conveyed them unto him. One after another, the householders have to send him this food. The turn, however, cometh to a particular family at intervals of many long years. If there are any that seek to avoid it, the rich also slay them with their children and wives and devour them all. There is, in this country, a city called Vetrakia, where liveth the king of these territories. He is ignorant of the science of government, and possessed of little intelligence, he adopts not with care any measure by which these territories may be rendered safe for all time to come. 
but we certainly deserve it all. And that's because we live within the dominion of the wretched and weak monarch in perpetual anxiety. Brahmanas can never be made to dwell permanently within the dominions of any one, for they are dependent on nobody. They live rather like birds ranging all countries in perfect freedom. It hath been said that one must secure a good king, then a wife, and then wealth. It is by the acquisition of these three that one can rescue his relatives and sons. But as regards the acquisition of these three, the course of my actions hath been the reverse. Hence, plunged into a sea of danger, am suffering sorely. That turn, destructive of one's family, hath now devolved upon me. I shall have to give unto the rich Osses's fee the food of the aforesaid description and one human being to boot. I have no wealth to buy a man with. I cannot by any means consent to part with any one of my family, nor do I see any way of escape from the clutches of that rich Osa. I am now sunk in an ocean of grief from which there is no escape. I shall go to that wretch also today, attended by all my family in order that that wretch might devour us all at once. Section 163 Kami said, Grieve not at all, O Brahmana, on account of this danger. I see a way by which to rescue thee from the wretch also. Thou hast only one son, who, besides, is of very tender years, also only one daughter, young and helpless, so I do not like that any of these, or thy wife, or even thyself should go unto the rich also. I have five sons, O Brahmana, let one of them go, carrying in thy behalf tribute of that rich also. Hearing this, the Brahman replied, To save my own life, I shall never suffer this to be done. I shall never sacrifice, to save myself, the life of a Brahmin or of a guest. Indeed, even those that are of low origin and of sinful practices refuse to do what asks me to do. It is said that one should sacrifice oneself and one's offspring for the benefit of a Brahmana. I regard this advice excellent and I like to follow it too. When I have to choose between the death of a Brahmana and that of my own, I would prefer the latter. The killing of a Brahmana is the highest sin, and there is no expiation for it. I think a reluctant sacrifice of one's own self is better than the reluctant sacrifice of a Brahmana. O oh, blessed lady, in sacrificing myself I do not become guilty of self-destruction. No sin can attach to me when another will take my life. But if I deliberately consent to the death of a Brahmana, it would be a cruel and sinful act, from the consequence of which there is no escape. The learned have said that the abandonment of one who hath come to thy house or sought thy protection, as also the killing of one who seeks death at thy hands, is both cruel and sinful. The illustrious among those conversing with practices allowable in seasons have distress, have before now said that one should never perform an act that is cruel and censurable. It is well for me that I should today perish myself with my wife, but I would never sanction the death of a Brahmana. Kani said, I too am firmly of opinion, O Brahmana, that Brahmana should ever be protected. As regards myself, no son of mine would be less dear to me even if I had a hundred instead of the five I have. But this Rikshaza will not be able to kill my son, for that son of mine is endued with great prowess and energy, and skilled in mantras. He will faithfully deliver to the Rikshaza his food, but will, I know to a certainty, rescue himself. I have seen before many mighty Rakshasas of huge bodies engaged in combat with my heroic son and killed you by him. But, O Brahmana, do not disclose this fact to anybody, for if it be known, persons desirous of obtaining this power, will, from curiosity, always trouble my sons. The wise have said that if my son importeth any knowledge, without the assent of his preceptor, unto any person, my son himself will no longer be able to profit by that knowledge. Thus stressed by Prita, the Brahmana with his wife became exceedingly glad and assented to Kunta's speech, which was unto them as nectar.
Then Kunti, accompanied by the Brahmana, went unto the son of Vada, Bhima, and asked him to accomplish that difficult task. Bhima replied unto them, saying, So be it. Section 164 Vahampayana said, after Bhima had pledged himself to accomplish the task, saying, I will do it, the Pandavas, O B H A R A T A, returned home with the alms they had obtained during the day. Then Yudhishthira, the son of Pandu from Bhima's countenance alone, suspected the nature of the task he had undertaken to accomplish. Sitting by the side of his mother, Yudhishthira asked her in private, What is the task, O oh mother, that Bhima of terrible prowess seeketh to accomplish? Goth he do so at thy commander of his own accord. Kunti replied, Bhima, that chastiser of foes, will at my command, do this great deed for the good of the Brahmana and the liberation of this town. Yudhishthira said, What rashat hast thou done, O oh mother? It is difficult of being performed and almost amounteth to suicide. The learn never applaud the abandonment of one's own child. Why dost thou, O oh mother, wish to sacrifice thy own child for the sake of an others? Thou hast, O oh mother, by this abandonment of thy child, acted not only against the course of human practices but also against the teachings of the Vedas, the Bhima, relying on whose arms we sleep happily in the night and hope to recover the kingdom of which we have been deprived by the covetous son of Dharitarashtra, that hero of immeasurable energy, remembering whose prowess Driyadana and Sopnida not sleep a wind during the whole night and by whose prowess we are rescued from the palace of lack and various other dangers, the Bhima who cause the death of Purikana, and relying on whose might we regard ourselves as having already slain the sons of Dharitarashtra and acquired the whole earth with all our wealth, upon what considerations, O mother, hast thou resolved upon abandoning him? Hast thou been deprived of thy reason? Hath thy understanding been clouded by the calamities thou hast undergone? On hearing these words of her son, Kani said, O Yudhishthira, thou needst not be at all anxious on account of Rukhidra. I have not come to this resolve owing to any weakness of understanding. Respected by him, and with our sorrows assuaged, we have, O son, been living in the house of this Brahmana, unknown to the sons of Dharitarashtra. For recting, O son, that Brahmana, I have resolved to do this. He, indeed, is a man upon whom good offices are never lost. The measure of his requital become a greater than the measure of the services he receiveth. Beholding the prowess of Bhima on the occasion of our escape from the house of Lack, and from the destruction also of Hyatamtha, my confidence in Vrkhidara is great. The might of Bhima's arms is equal unto that of ten thousand elephants. It was, therefore, that he succeeded in carrying you all, each heavy as an elephant, from Varanata. There is no one on earth equal unto Bhima in might. He may even overcome the foremost of warriors, the holder of the thunderbolt himself. Soon after his birth he fell from my lap on the breast of the mountain. By the weight of his body the mass of stone on which he fell down broke in pieces. From this also, O son of Pandu, I have come to know Bhima's might. For this reason have I resolved to set him against the Brahmana's foe. I have not acted in this from foolishness or ignorance or from motive of gain. I have deliberately resolved to do this virtuous deed. By this act, O Yudhishthira, two objects will be accomplished. One is the requital of the services rendered by the Brahmana and the other is the acquisition of high religious merit. It is my conviction that the KSHATRIYA who rendereth help unto a Brahmana in anything acquireth regions have bliss hereafter. So also a KSHATRIYA who saveth the life of a KSHATRIYA achieveth that great fame in this world as in the other. A KSHATRIYA rendering help unto a Varya also on this earth certainly acquires worldwide popularity.
one of the kingly tribe should protect even the Sodra who come to him for protection. If he death so, in his next life he receiveth his birth in a royal line, commanding prosperity and the respect of other kings. O sign of proof's race, the illustrious Vyas of wisdom acquired by hard ascetic toil told me so in bygone days. It is therefore that I have resolved upon accomplishing this. Section 165 Having heard these words of his mother, Yudhishthira said, What thou, O mother, hast deliberately done, moved by compassion for the afflicted Brahmana, is, indeed, excellent Bhima will certainly come back with life, after having slain the cannibal, in Nasmika's heart, O mother, always compassionate unto Brahmanas. But tell the Brahmana, O mother, that he doth not do anything whereby the dwellers in this town may know all about it. And make him promise to keep the I request. Vayampayana continued, then, when the night passed away, B-H-I-M-A-F-C-N-A, the son of Pandu, taking with him the Rakshasa's food, set out for the place where the cannibal lived. The mighty son of Pandu, approaching the forest where the Rakshasa dwelt, began to eat himself the food he carried, calling loudly to the Rakshasa by name. The Rakshasa, inflamed with anger at Bhima's words, came out and approached the place where Bhima was. Of huge body and great strength, of red eyes, red beard, and red hair, he was terrible to behold, and he came, pressing deep to earth with his tread. The opening of his mouth was from ear to ear and his ears themselves were straight as arrows. Of grim visage, he had a forehead furrowed into three lines. Beholding Bhima eating his food, the Rikshosa advanced, biting his nether lip and expanding his eyes in wrath. And addressing Bhima he said, Who is this fool, who desiring to go to the abode of Yama, eateth in my very sight the food intended for me? Hearing these words, Bhima, O Bharata, smiled in derision and disregarding the Rikshosa, continued eating with averted face. Beholding this, the cannibal uttered a frightful yell and with both arms upraised ran at Bhima desiring to kill him. There and then. Even then disregarding the Rikshosa and casting only a single glance at him, Rukhidara, that slayer of hostile heroes continued to eat the Rakshasa's food. Filled with wrath at this, the Rikshasa struck, from behind with both his arms a heavy blow on the back of Rukhidara, the son of Kunti. But Bhima, though struck heavily by the mighty Rikshasa, with both his hands, did not even look up at the Rikshasa but continued to eat as before. Then the mighty Rikshasa, inflamed with wrath, tore up a tree and ran at Bhima for striking him again. Meanwhile the mighty Bhima, the bull among men had leisurely eaten up the whole of that food and washing himself stood cheerfully for fight. Then, O Bharata, possessed of great energy, Bhima, smiling in derision, caught with his left hand the tree hurled at him by the Rikshasa in wrath. Then the mighty Rikshasa, tearing up many more trees, hurled them at Bhima, and the Pandava also hurled as many of the Rikshasa. Then, O King, the combat with trees between that human being and the Rikshasa became so terrible that the region around soon became destitute of trees. Then the Rikshasa, saying that he was none else in Vaka, sprang upon the Pandava and seized the mighty Bhima with his arms. The mighty hero also clasping with his own strong arms the strong-armed Rikshasa, and exerting himself actively, began to drag him violently. Dragged by Bhima and dragging Bhima also, the cannibal was overcome with great fatigue. The earth began to tremble in consequence of the strength they both exerted, and large trees that stood there broke in pieces. Then Bhima, beholding the cannibal overcome with fatigue, pressed him down on the earth with his knees and began to strike him with great force. Then placing one knee on the middle of the Rakshasa's back, Bhima seized his neck with his right hand and the cloth on his waist with his left, and bent him double with great force. 
the cannibal then roared frightfully. And, oh monarch, he also began to vomit blood while he was being thus broken on BHIMAS knee. Section 166 Vampayana said then Vaka, huge as a mountain, thus broken, on BHIMAS knee, died, uttering frightful yells. Terrified by these sounds, the relatives of the Rich also came out, O King, with their attendants. BHIMA, that foremost of smitters, seeing them so terrified and deprived of reason, comforted them and made them promise to give up cannibalism, saying, do not ever again kill human beings. If ye kill men, ye will have to die even as Vaka. Those wretches is hearing the speech of BHIMA, said, so be it, and gave, O King, the desired promise. From that day, O-B-H-A-R-A-T-A, -A, the Rekshases, of the region, were seen by the inhabitants of the town to be very peaceful towards mankind. Then B-H-I-M-A, dragging the lifeless cannibal, placed him at one of the gates of the town and went away unobserved by anyone. The kingsmen of Akka, beholding him slain by the mighty B-H-I-M-A, became frightened and fled in different directions. Meanwhile BHIMA, having slain the Rakshasa, returned to the Brahman as a boat and related to Yudhishthira all that had happened, in detail. The next morning the inhabitants of the town in coming out saw the Rakshasa lying dead on the ground, his body covered with blood. Beholding the terrible cannibal, huge as a mountain cliff, thus mangled and lying on the ground, the hair of the spectator stood erect. Returning to Ekokkra, they soon gave the intelligence. Then, O King, the citizens by thousands, accompanied by their wives, young and old, all began to come to the spot for beholding the Vaka and they were all amazed at seeing that superhuman feat. Instantly, O Monarch, they began to pray to their gods. Then they began to calculate whose turn it had been the day before to carry food to the Rikshasa. And ascertaining this, they all came to the Brahmana and asked him to satisfy their curiosity. Thus asked by them repeatedly, the bull among Brahmanas, desirous of concealing the Pandavas, said these words unto all the citizens, a certain high self Brahmana, skilled in mantras, beheld me weeping with my relatives after I had been ordered to supply the Rakshasa's food. Asking me the cause and ascertaining the distress of the town, that first of Brahmanas gave me every assurance and with smiles said, I shall carry the food for the wretched Rakshasa today. Do not fear for me. Saying this he conveyed the food towards the forest of Akka. This deed, so beneficial unto a soul, hath very certainly been done by him. Then those Brahmanas and Kshatriyas of the city, hearing this, wondered much. And the Vayas and the Sodras also became exceedingly glad, and they all established a festival in which the worship of Brahmanas was a principal ceremony, in remembrance of this Brahmana who had relieved them from their fears of Akka. The Mahabharata of Krishna Dwapriyana Vyasa Translated into English, prose from the original Sanskrit, text by Kasari Mohan Gangli, 1883-1896. Calcutta, 